The Buddha said that all skillful qualities have their root in heedfulness. This emphasis on heedfulness is one of the remnants of the wilderness source for Buddhism. The Buddha gained his awakening in the wilderness, passed away in the wilderness, recommended that his monks go out into the wilderness. And one of the qualities you need in order to survive in the wilderness is heedfulness, because there are dangers on all sides. There was a famous writer who spent a lot of time with the Inuit. And when he was asked what was the quality that distinguished them from people in modern civilization, he listed a few words from their language which described a quality that he said he didn't quite find the right English equivalent for. A combination of wariness, apprehension, a sense of danger present all around. What's heedfulness? The realization that there are dangers and you have to be very careful about what you do. Where Buddhism's emphasis on heedfulness is special is that it identifies the dangers as lying primarily in the mind, but also has a sense of possibilities. If you didn't have the confidence that your actions could lead to safety, heedfulness would be meaningless. If there were dangers all around you couldn't do anything about them, you'd just have to give in to the dangers and get fatalistic about them. Or just stay confused. This is why the Buddha said there's another quality that takes heedfulness and makes it a quality for awakening, and that's appropriate attention, seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths and then applying the duties to what you're actually doing. Because the Four Noble Truths raise our sights as to what is possible for human beings to do. We can put an end to suffering. We don't have to keep coming back again and again and again. And it lies within our power to do that. So here, heedfulness is combined with confidence that there is a way out. But it's also this confidence makes heedfulness very demanding. There are a lot of dangers in life that people simply accept and say, well, that's the way life is. I was talking the other night to someone who was talking about how she was trying to analyze her unskillful mind states and to check on why she would go for them. And one of the conclusions she came to is, well, it's a normal human reaction. People do th things that are displeasing, and the normal reaction is to get angry. You see something nice, and the normal reaction is greed. And it may be the normal reaction, but it's not the best. It's really not the best that we're capable of. The Buddha is actually pointing out that the mind doesn't have to stay on the quote-unquote normal human level. We meditate so that we can transform it. That's a good question, how many people come to the meditation to be transformed? For a lot of people, simply want a nice place for the mind to hang out. Don't ask for much change beyond that. But the Buddha is saying, if you otherwise simply allow the mind to go back to its old habits, you're being heedless. Areas where other people don't see dangers, he saw dangers. Areas where other people didn't see a way out, he saw a way out. Take, for instance, our attachment to the body. It's a normal thing. As long as we have a body, we have to take care of it, and it seems natural to be attached to it. But what happens, of course, is as you're attached to the body, that gives you a reason to be afraid of death. And simply the fact that you have a body leaves you open to all kinds of attacks, attacks from outside, attacks from within the body itself. As John Fun used to like to say, Every part of the body has its disease. In fact, every part of the body, he says, is a disease. The passages in the canon that list the various diseases that can come in the different parts of the body. He had a very creative way of translating the terms. There were the chakurogo, 
eye diseases. He translated the passage as saying basically, the eye is a disease. The simple fact that you have eyes and ears, a heart, lungs, means you're open to all the kinds of diseases that can happen to eyes, ears, heart, lungs. And we just take that for granted. And the Buddha says you don't have to. It is possible for the mind to experience formless states. Now that may be something you don't know for sure, that if it is possible. But he recommends that you take it on as a working hypothesis because it opens possibilities for safety that you wouldn't have otherwise. Because having a body requires also that you feed it. And when as you're looking for food, you get into conflict with other other people, other beings who are looking for their food. But if the mind can attain a formless state, it doesn't have to get into those conflicts. It's not exposed to those dangers. And as he says, when there's a, whenever there's a choice between an assumption that places limits on what you can do, and an assumption that opens possibilities for what you can do, he says that it's always better to adopt the assumption that allows for more possibilities. Because otherwise, the simple act of assuming that there are no possibilities cuts off what could be a potential avenue for, for safety and happiness. So we apply appropriate attention to our heedfulness, reminding ourselves that there are possibilities that go beyond the ordinary human level. There's a possibility for safety that goes beyond the ordinary human level. The mind can be perfectly fine without a body. In fact, in the higher levels of the heavens, it's not only perfectly fine, it's much better off. Nirvana also has no body. That's the ultimate happiness. So you turn around and look at your attachment to the body and ask yourself, is this something I want to hold on to? When you realize that's there's a possibility that you could be freed from that, then you're more likely to actually follow the path that would free you. We have that contemplation of the different parts of the body. A lot of people don't like it, but they don't see it as an avenue to freedom. They just see it as bad-mouthing something that they would prefer to be attached to. But the Buddha is saying, question that preference, question that attachment. Be heedful and expand your imagination through appropriate attention as to what the possibilities for safety that heedfulness can bring might be. So it's not simply that we're aware of dangers. That's part of heedfulness. They're all around us, especially now in the fire season, we have to be very careful. But there are more dangers than that. There are dangers inside. At the same time, heedfulness, at least in the Buddhist point of view, encompasses confidence that there is a way out from these dangers, a total freedom from these dangers. And even though it may be more than ordinary human level of safety, you start with ordinary human capabilities, and as you develop them, they can take you there. Always keep that assumption in mind. Because it, it's the assumption that doesn't leave you trapped in the dangers that we see all around us. It opens the way out. <laughs>